Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. The topic of today's lecture is the neurological conditions affecting the skin. I discussed one of the aspect of this uh, chapter in my previous lecture, that is the neuropathic ulcers. So in this lecture today, I'm going to discuss the other neurological conditions that affect the skin. Introduction. The relationship between the nervous system and skin is complex and obvious. The neurocutaneous disorders are divided broadly into those that are associated with sensory abnormalities and those that are associated with autonomic abnormalities, although there is an overlap between these two groups. So the skin manifestation may occur when pathology is predominantly located either in the central nervous system or in peripheral nervous system. An understanding of skin sensory and autonomic innervation is essential to appreciate the clinical manifestations of neurodermatological disorders. So first, briefly, let's briefly discuss the skin innervation. The sensory system contains receptors for touch, temperature, pain, itch, vibration, and various other physical and chemical stimuli. The autonomic nervous system comprises of postganglionic cholinergic parasympathetic nerves and adrenergic and cholinergic sympathetic nerves. So there are two kinds of uh, postganglionic nerves, the cholinergic parasympathetic nerves and adrenergic and cholinergic sympathetic nerves. There are as many as 1,000 such afferent neurons that innervate only one centimeter square of the skin. The sensory innovation follow a well-defined dermatomal pattern, as we all know, with some overlap between the adjacent dermatomes. The sensory nerves not only function as the efferent system to conduct the stimuli from the skin back to the CNS, but they also act as the efferent neurosecretory fashion, releasing neuropeptides with important visceromotor, inflammatory and trophic effects on the skin. So not only the sensory nerves uh, act as efferent nerves taking the sensations to, uh, to CNS, but also secrete some visceromotor inflammatory and trophic uh, cytokines. Then autonomic nervous system. Histochemically, there are two main groups of postganglionic nerve fiber in the skin, as already mentioned, the sympathetic and parasympathetic. The first, the adrenergic fibers synthesize and store catecholamines and norepinephrine. These are the sympathetic. And second is the parasympathetic containing cholinergic fibers, containing acetylcholine. The secretory portion of the eccrine gland, uh, sweat gland, the myoepithelial uh, cells and uh, blood vessels are innervated by the nerves containing predominantly acetylcholine. Blood vessels in the skin are innervated by adrenergic fibers which are vasoconstrictor, while the acetylcholine and neuropeptides such as VIP and PHM act as vasodilator and increase the vascular permeability. Adrenergic fibers mediate strong vasoconstriction and erector pili muscle activity, creating the goosebumps, 
and uh, thus diverting the blood from the skin and pulling the hair in upright position. This is a classical fight or flight reaction. So uh, the secretory portion of the sweat glands, myoepithelial cells are the are supplied by mainly parasympathetic nerves containing acetylcholine, while the blood vessels. Uh, vasoconstriction is mainly due to the sympathetic nerve secreting uh, um, so secreting the norepinephrine or vasodilatation is conducted by the sympathetic nerve secreting acetylcholine. And in addition, VIP and PHM also play a role. So in an, in an event of stress, that is the fight or flight reaction, the sympathetic activity mediated by norepinephrine predominates, resulting in vasoconstriction and um, erector pili constriction. The first condition we are going to discuss today is syringomyelia. Syringomyelia is a rare disorder that is characterized by a longitudinal cyst in the cervical cord or and or the medulla, which is called as the syringobulbia, immediately anterior to the central canal and spreads asymmetrically to each side. The central nervous system disturbance cause a dissociate sensory loss with pain and temperature sense being lost early in fingers and upper limbs. Clinical features. Symptoms usually appear in young adults and disease generally slowly progresses over 20 to 30 years. There are associated abnormalities as well, like a short neck and low hairline, suggesting a developmental origin. Body asymmetry or hemihypertrophy is also known to occur in syringomyelias. There is early effect on pain and temperature fibers, leading to characteristic dissociate sensory loss in um, upper limb. However, the sensations of touch, vibration and position remains intact. So the clue to diagnose syringomyelia is the dissociate sensory loss, loss of some sensations and intact other sensations. The earliest manifestation of the disease is tendency to painless burns and cuts on hand and form, forearms due to loss of pain and temperature sense. Later on, upper motor neuron signs in the leg may accompany like weakness, wasting and loss of reflexes in arms. The Morvan syndrome, it is the progressive pain loss, skin ulceration, soft tissue loss, and resorption of phalanges and muscular atrophy which occasionally develop in syringomyelia. To investigate, MRI is the investigation of choice. Then uh, management, neurosurgical and orthopedic evaluation is warranted for all patients with uh, the syrinx. Surgical indications have been stated as progression of motor and sensory loss, scoliosis, associate pain and increasing in size of the syrinx. The second condition we are going to discuss is spinal dysgraphism. This is a neurological disorder involving the malformation of the spinal cord due to failure of symmetrical fusion of embryo embryological spinal structures and referred as spinal dysgraphism. It is characterized uh, clinically into two subsets. The open type, in open type, there is uh, this uh, spinal dysgraphism is exposed to the environment, 
फॉर एग्जाम्पल स्पाइना बायोफिडा माइलो मेनिंगोसील और एम एम सी देन इट्स देर सेकेंड टाइप इज क्लोज विच इज कवर्ड बाय एन इंटैक्ट स्किन The dermatologist may be the first physician to see such patients and should be aware of the possible associations with underlying neurological abnormalities. So, what is uh, seen initially is a coccygeal dimple, which is sometimes unrelated to dysgraphism, whereas many lumbosacral skin abnormalities are associated. with spinal dysgraphism and called teeth ring and uh, such as lipomas port wine stains hemangiomas a fontaine nevus which is um, pigmented nevus at the coccyx pigmented macules pits or dimples so if you find such kind of abnormalities in the coccygeal region of a young infant then you must always suspect the spinal dysgraphism patients with congenital giant melanocytic nevi overlying the scalp or dorsal spine may also show brain abnormalities on mri for occult dysgraphism that is hidden Midline skin abnormalities have considerable diagnostic value, and they are divided into three groups. The group one, which is a high risk of having spinal dysgraphism, two or more lesions like subcutaneous lipoma, a dermal sinus, or a fontaine tail nevus. Group two is low risk and has atypical dimple, aplasia cutis. or gluteal fold deviation then group 3 is very low risk and this is characterized by hemangioma port wine stain hypertrichosis fibroma pendulum pigmentary nevus and coccygeal dimple lesions preventing spinal cord ascent during the normal growth can cause undue traction on the lower end of the coccyx and produce corda equina syndrome such patients are slow in learning to walk sensations may be impaired on the toes uh, impaired over the areas innervated by the lowest sacral segment causing characteristic saddle shape analgesia over the buttocks and dorsa of the thighs sometimes trophic changes are also obvious in these areas in mild cases feet are cold and cyanotic cutaneous injuries heal slowly and tend to ulcerate particularly on the feet and in the analgesic skin of buttocks and the thighs the most severe neurological abnormality is the flaccid paraparesis with sphincter paralysis <clears throat> investigations so estimation of alpha fetoprotein in the amniotic fluid or maternal serum successfully identifies in the fetus a severe central nervous system malformation such as spina bifida cystica or n encaphale a spinal ultrasound is most helpful when supported by multiple clinical indications management the open dysgraphism initial treatment is with saline gauzes at 37 degree and non permeable dressings management aims to provide the closure of the neural tube defect and the skin without undesirable tension within 24 to 48 hours early primary closure often has an excellent outcome due to risk of neurological deterioration the recommended treatment of cds 
with or without concomitant interspinal dermoid is prompt administration of antibiotics and definitive surgical intervention. The next topic is the dermatoses which are associated with the spinal cord injury. So spinal cord may be injured directly by penetrating wound or indirectly following dislocation or fracture, dislocation of the vertebral columns. Causes of spinal cord injury are trauma, including motor vehicle accident, which is contribute to 36 to 48%, violence, 5 to 29%, fall, 17 to 21%, and recreational ex activities accidents, 7 to 16%. Skin of patients with spinal cord injury is prone to number of inflammatory dermatoses and disorders of Sweating. So both sweating and autonomic dysfunctions. Savoria and savoric dermatitis are reported in quadriplegic patients. Numular eczema may occur below the level of the lesion. Acne on the back and buttocks may follow onset of paralysis. Then profuse sweating on the face, neck and upper trunk with lesions at or above T6 may occur as an exaggerated response to stimuli such as bowel or bladder dysfunction. This is called as autonomic dysreflexia. There are episodes of facial flushing and headache. Other patients may develop sweating of face and arm after dizziness due to postural hypotension. Again, the sympathetic effects. Dryness of the skin, particularly on the sole. Then pressure ulceration may also occur as one of the complications. Management. The inflammatory dermatoses associated with spinal cord injury should be treated appropriately and with topical and systemic therapies. The next Topic is hereditary sensory and autonomic neuropathies, abbreviated as uh, HSAN. It encompasses a number of inherited disorders that are associated with both sensory and autonomic dysfunction. The sensory dysfunction include depressed reflexes, altered pain and temperature perception, while autonomic dysfunction include the gastroesophageal reflux, postural hypotension, and excess sweating. For dermatologists, HSAN will usually be encountered in patients with disordered sweating accompanied by severe sensory dysfunction. So if a patient is reported with abnormal sweating and sensory irregularities, then you must suspect hereditary sensory and autonomic neuropathies. Advances have been made in identifying the specific loci and genes implicated in different types of HSAN and resulting in disease mechanisms. We are going to discuss the most common two types. The HSAN type 1 present late childhood or adolescent with progressive loss of all sensations in lower extremity, particularly pain and temperature. This often results in chronic trophic ulceration on weight-bearing areas of feet and associated with osteomyelitis and mutilating deformities. Later on, muscle wasting, weakness and lancinating pain in lower limbs may also develop. While in type 2, present with sensory loss, sensations loss in hands as well as feet, leading to ulceration at sides such as forehead, trunk, tongue, lip, falling repeated injury. Fingers show enhem-like constriction bands and spontaneous amputation. The loss of deep sensations result in deep ulcerations, osteomyelitis, stress fractures and long bone injury. Loss of tendon reflexes and anhydrosis occur in areas of decreased sensations.
differential diagnosis. Other disorders accompanied by self-mutilating behavior, such as leash nahan syndrome and untreated phenylketonuria must be kept in mind. Then diabetic neuropathy mimics some aspects of adult onset HSAN. Complication and comorbidity, the commonest, are the corneal scarring, multiple fractures, joint deformities, osteomyelitis, and disabling self-mutilations. Malignant hyperthermia and sepsis are major cause of mortality. Mortality, behavioral disorders, and learning difficulties significantly decrease after the age of three years. Investigations. Diagnosis is based on clinical findings and molecular genetic testing. Higher urinary excretion of uh, sphingomyelin and lecithin suggest a disorder of phospholipid metabolism. Then electrophysiology and neural histopathology are also useful. Management. The ambient temperature must be controlled to help counter problems associated with sweating dysfunction. Protective aids can be used to reduce self-mutilating injuries. When, when necessary, wound care and antiseptic treatment should be in initiated. A greasy emollient applied regularly to the skin of neuropathic limbs may moderate the callus formation. Then let's discuss some facts about a sympathetic nerve injury. Interruption of sympathetic innervation of skin results in two types of uh, effects. The vasoconstrictor uh, impulses uh, are lost, resulting in continuous erythema and uh, sweating, uh, causing anhydrosis. The areas of vasodilatation generally match the area of anhydrosis suggesting a close correspondence of pseudomotor and vasoconstrictor fibers. So once the sympathetic innervation is lost, the vessels are dilated and the sweating is reduced. Sympathetic nerve injury usually occur when sympathetic axons are injured by trauma, affecting major nerves. There can be dissociation of pseudomotor and pilomotor activity, after a sympathetic ganglionectomy. Clinical features. In addition to erythema and anhydrosis, affected, affected skin may be scaly and fissured. The denervated areas, there are loss of cutaneous sensations, possibly due to regeneration of post-ganglionic collagen fibers, while some patients report hyperesthesia as well. When sympathetic denervation is combined with loss of somatic sensations, as in peripheral nerve injury or severe peripheral neuropathy, neuropathic ulcers also develop. Sympathetic denervation may also slow or prevent the normal graying of hair. So if sympathetic nerves are lost, then graying of hair is also reduced. And it may also cause hyperpigmentation of skin in the affected area. So increase melanocytic activity. Investigations. The affected area of skin should be physically examined for sweating, temperature, allodynia, and hyper, uh, hyperalgesia. Measurement of sweating and vasomotor response can help determine the extent of autonomic denervation then pupillary examination is also indicated. Laboratory tests include SSR, thermoregulatory sweat test, quantitative pseudomotor axon reflex test, skin wrinkling, water immersion, or microneurography. Merriment is appropriate neurological, neurosurgical management of the damaged nerves but mostly these nerves cannot be repaired. Complex regional pain syndrome, CRPS, is a, dis, uh, is a debilating, painful condition of the limb 
commonly arise after injury and is associated with sensory motor and autonomic nerve problems along with problems of bone and skin. The predisposing factors include a stroke, myocardial infarction, tuberculosis, herpes zoster, and certain drugs. The dermatological condition include vasculitis and paniculitis. This uh, syndrome, complex regional pain syndrome, is divided into two types. The type 1 is more common and uh, a major nerve lesion is absent. And type 2 is less common and major nerve lesion is present. This uh, complex regional pain syndrome affects one limb, but in 7% is spread to the other limb. Onset of symptom is usually within a month of trauma or Im immobilization of a limb. Symptoms fall in three stages. Stage 1. Begins after several days or weeks and lasts for about a month. And this is characterized by spontaneous burning, stinging, tearing or shooting pain which is precipitated by mechanical stimuli such as bathing, clothing on the skin, etc. The second stage begins after one to seven months and lasts for three to six months. And this is the stage of sympathetic hyperactivity. The skin is cool because of increased sweating, edematous, hyperhydrotic, and cyanotic with levido like changes. Nail may be brittle and pain is variable. So pain is not prominent in second stage, but sympathetic overactivity is prominent. While in third stage, which starts after eight months, and uh, it involves progressive tissue damage which can become permanent. The changes are due to vas vasoconstruction resulting in skin hypoxia, decreased motion of skin from inactivity of underlying joints, tendon or ligaments. So the trophic changes include uh, skin being shiny, atrophic and dry, fingertips are sh sh may shrink, and deeper structures like fascia thicken resulting in contractures. Investigation by electrodiagnostic studies like needle electromyography, nerve conduction studies, which are normal in type 1 because there is no major nerve injury, but may demonstrate a peripheral nerve injury in type 2. Patchy osteoporosis is seen in some x-rays. CT MRI scan may show atrophy and soft tissue swelling and bone mineralization changes. The Budapest criteria to diagnose complex regional pain syndrome include allodynia or hyperalgesia, temperature asymmetry, skin color changes or asymmetry, edema or sweating changes, decreased range of motions and or motor dysfunctions like weakness, tremor and dystonia and lastly the trophic changes on the skin. There is no management, uh, no proven cure for complex regional pain syndrome. An integrated interdisciplinary treatment approach is recommended. Prompt diagnosis, early treatment is considered best therapy to prevent this occurrence. Uh, the four pillars of care are education, pain relief, physical rehabilitation and psychological intervention. Primary aim are to reduce the pain, preserve or restore function, and enable patient to manage their condition. So treatment letter. First is mobilization and desensitization of affected joint and psychological intervention. Second line are biophosphonates, pain clinic management, and morphine, oxycodone, tremolol, methyl... Um, methadone on and um, levorphenol, all painkillers. Then in third line, intravenous regional sympathetic blockade may be required and rarely surgery. Then the next topic is Horner syndrome. Horner syndrome follows partial or complete interruption of sympathetic nerve pathway of the face and is characterized, characterized by three things, the ptosis, meiosis and anhydrosis. 
Horner syndrome may follow sympathetically for treatment of primary of palmar and axillary hyperhidrosis and occur in 40% of patients with open cervical sympathectomy. It usually found in adults and only rarely in children. The first or irritative phase occur early at the onset and it is characterized by transient unilateral hyperhidrosis and vasoconstriction. Then uh, the paralytic phase uh, comes in, resulting in drooping of the eyelids, which is the ptosis, narrowing of the palpebral fissure. Pupil is small, which is meiosis, and show normal reflux constriction to light and accommodation. Inflammation of conjunctiva is often present. Sweating is absent on the ipsilateral side of the face. And there is slight retraction of eye into the orbit, which is called as the N of Thelmos. Investigation, physical examination, pupil dilatation testing using hydroxyamphetamine eye drops can confirm the diagnosis. To elicit the underlying cause, X-ray, MRI and blood and urine tests may be needed. Treatment is directed towards the underlying cause. Gustatory hyperhidrosis. It is described as excessive sweating occurring immediately after eating spicy or hot food. Gustatory sweating is localized to certain areas like scalp, upper lip, perioral area and sternum. And it may also occur following damage to sympathetic cervical trunk, the vagus nerve or auriculotemporal nerve. Fry syndrome describes gustatory sweating and facial flushing and emerged 3 to 24 months after surgery involving the parotid or temporomandibular joint. The minor starch iodine test and infrared thermography is used to investigate the symptoms and confirm the diagnosis. Management of gustatory hyperhidrosis is topical preparation containing aluminum chloride hexahydrate or 0.5% aqua solution of glycopyronium bromide topically, which is safe, well-tolerated, and convenient in diabetes-associated gustatory sweating. Then botulinum toxin is shown to be effective and safe in gustatory sweating like other uh, sweatings. The restless leg syndrome or burning feet syndrome, it is also an interesting topic. The restless leg syndrome is a common sleep and movement disorder that is characterized by uncomfortable twitching sensation in the leg muscles <clears throat> while sitting or lying down and is relieved only by moving the legs. While the burning feet syndrome is characterized by a burning and aching sensation on the feet, hyperesthesia accompanied by vasomotor changes causing excessive sweating. This is also a common complaint our patients give to us. The burning feet syndrome is poorly recognized and underdiagnosed condition consisting of burning sensation in the feet, which is accentuated by heat or cold. And the associated autonomic features include the dry skin on the feet, eye and mouth, and vasomotor symptoms with peripheral coldness, burning and flushing, hypertension and impotence. There is a long list of predisposing factors to these two conditions. Diabetes is the most important as well as the chronic kidney disease, the alcohol overuse, hypothyroidism. Also seen in Lyme's disease and AIDS. Then amyloid polyneuropathy, vasculitis, sarcoidosis, Guillain-Barre disease may also be the predisposing factors. Hypertension and arterial disease also contribute so does the vitamin B12 and B6 deficiency. And drugs may lead to these conditions and these drugs include vitamin B6 overdose, the HIV medicines, isoniazide, niazide, amadurone, and metformin. It can be a result of heavy metal poisoning like lead, mercury, and arsenic. Pathophysiology. The restless leg syndrome represents a subclinical sensory neuropathy. 
Other have suggested a dopamine imbalance due to presence of dyskinetic movements and response to levodopa. 30% of patients also have iron deficiency. Restless leg syndrome is common in hemodialysis patients and associated with pregnancy, fibromyalgia, rheumatoid arthritis, and MS. Clinical features. RLS is characterized by leg paresthesias associated with an irresistible urge to move the leg, um, move the leg while in rest. Movement of leg provide relief. Symptoms are worse at night, and uh, both circadian rhythm and recumbency playing a role. And this lead to disruption of normal life and chronic sleep deprivation. Children may struggle at school and display symptoms of attention deficit disorder, uh, deficit hyperactivity disorder. The main clinical features of burning feet syndrome is burning sensation of feet accentuated by heat or cold. Associated autonomic functions include foot dysthesias, dry skin, dry eyes and mouth, peripheral coldness, burning and flushing. The differential diagnosis of restless leg syndrome include peripheral neuropathy, Parkinsonism, nocturnal leg cramps, peripheral vascular disease and ADHD. Burning fits feet syndrome, the main differential is the uh, peripheral neuropathy. Management. Some believe the first choice of treatment of restless leg syndrome should be dopamine, dopaminergic agents such as levodopa or the long-acting one. Levodopa is efficacious in short-term treatment of restless leg syndrome. Recent studies with gabapentin report significant improvement in both idiopathic and hemodialysis-associated restless leg syndrome. Treatment with dopamine agonists can be complicated by augmentation. Can be complicated by augmentation and iatrogenic effect whereby symptoms burst with time. The second line treatment include opioids like oxycodone, codeine, and methadone and benzodiazepine. The treatment options of burning feet syndrome appear less defined than for restless leg syndrome. But treatments efficacious for later would probably also help the burning feet syndrome. So this brings to end of this talk. I hope this talk was helpful to you. And I think that uh, by uh, going through this lecture, you don't need to consult the chapter because this chapter um, is quite extensive and I've tried to extract the important information from the chapter in this lecture. Thank you very much for a very patient listening and see you next time with another edition of my lectures. Good. Uh...